Nick, good day, sir. Th- uh, welcome to the Pain and Performance Podcast. Uh, I'm excited to be here, Dr. Hines. It should uh, be a lot of fun today. Yeah, I'm excited to have you. I, you know, it, it's always kind of like an embarrassment of riches whenever we get to do these things with somebody like you because there's so much um, that we can 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 pick your brain on um, in terms of improving people's health, improving their quality of life, uh, and everything that's involved in that. So um, we were talking before we got on just on like, you know, at least one of the angles that you go after whenever you're working with patients and working with people is, um, you know, trying to get to like some of these unresolved issues that might be leading to their health problems. Um, let's let's start with some of that stuff and kind of what that looks like to you. How do you define some of those things? And, and I think one thing would be a good thing to kind of add on top of that is what do patients what do people look for to know if they're in that category? I think there's probably people who don't know that. Yeah, so that's a that's a great point that you that you bring up. So the main type of patients that we end up working with are last ditch effort patients, right? I mean, they're not coming to us first line saying, you know, I've got chronic pain. What do you got for me? No, they've already been to the chiropractors. They've already been not necessarily the chiropractors, the medical doctors. They've been on all kinds of different pain medications. They've tried even opiates. They you know, they've done the lab studies, you know, they've got their blood work, the blood chemistry panels, the real expensive ones where we've looked at all kinds of different things, all the functional medicine people, um, and, and they're still in chronic pain. It doesn't matter what the MRI says. It doesn't matter what the CT says. No one seems to know really what's wrong. So these people, they go hunting for answers, right? So they come to people like you. They come to the functional medicine community trying to find an answer. And by the time they find us, it, it's, it's been a long journey for them. And they're at the point where they're like, you know what, I've tried all this other stuff. And so we start digging a little bit and our focus is on how trauma, number one, can be related to uh, can be the underpinnings of our physical ailments. We call this psychosomatic illnesses, where the mind has an effect on the body. It's not woo-woo science. It's it's true. You know, anyone that's gone through a stressful situation will know their gastrointestinal system, it, you know, shrivels up, it gets tight, or, you know, they can't sleep at night because the worry that sort of comes. Any of these chronic patterns can turn into something related with the body. We see it with skin issues. Um, of course, there's anxiety, there's depression. We see it with gastrointestinal issues. We see it with chronic pain. All of these things can have emotional, psychological underpinnings. It could be abuse as a child. It could be a difficult divorce. It could be the loss of a parent. There's so many different things that can affect the individual that causes the body to manifest the actual disorder. Yeah, let's dig into that for a little bit. I think I don't think anybody would would disagree with the thought that that stress affects our health negatively. I think anyone who's suffered from that is like, I know that I feel terrible whenever I'm, I'm, you know, under a stressful situation, at least chronically. Right. You know, where it's you know, we're staying stressed for a longer period of time. Um, you know, and you look at all the studies on like people who are, are caretakers and stuff like that. And it's like, as, as you start to dig into some of this stuff, you start to think like this, this pattern that we get into is probably one of the most negative things that we can do for our health and aging. You know, if you really look at all these, the, the research around like the, the super agers and blue zones and stuff, we can tweeze out all the information on diet and exercise and all that stuff. But there's one underlying thing that goes through all of them. And it seems like that they have figured out a way to handle stress effects on the mind and body better than other areas around the world. Um, And so it's interesting that we like, we know those things intuitively, but I still feel like we kind of, at least in America, we know them and yet we kind of put it off to the side and we're like, yeah, Let's leave that as a last resort type of situation. Like, wouldn't it be amazing if you got those people where they're like, hey, I don't know if this has affected me yet, but I had this difficult situation and now I feel a little bit different. <laughs> you know, I have an interesting story to tell. Um, I was, uh, I'm an acupuncture, licensed acupuncturist and uh, I lived in San Diego for about a decade at the time. 
And uh, I had a good friend, and he was the lead. He owns a couple cancer clinics down in Tijuana. Great guy, Dr. Tony Jimenez. If you ever look him up or someone's looking for alternative cancer care, great guy and good program. I would go down and treat patients at his clinic once a week. And, uh, you know, getting across the border is always kind of fun. And so they have a driver, right? And so this great guy, Jose, he and I would chat all the time. And he would bring patients back and forth from the U.S. to the airport because people become, they were all U.S citizens for the most part and they would all go down to mexico here in tijuana and um so i would catch rides down and catch rides back and often there were other patients heading to the airport he was driving or something like that i had this time i'd been there for a couple days stayed the night and we were coming back and there was a, a woman there and uh i had treated her you know several different times and she had a tumor on her sacrum Okay, and it was had intertwined into her, you know, all the nerves within that sort of area. So it was compression on the nerve roots. I mean, she was in a lot of pain. When she sat, you could tell she couldn't sit straight. She kind of had to kind of sit back, right? And she was actually heading to the hospital in the U.S. because her situation had got pretty dire. And we're sitting at the border. There's an hour wait trying to get through the line. And she told me something out of the blue. You know all that stuff, she says, about eating healthy and exercising. That's, I was the epitome of the perfect example. I mean, I ate the perfect diet. I exercised. I did my yoga, all these sort of things. I'm not supposed to have this. This is not supposed to happen to me. And she's like, it just, there's... There is other pieces. And then she mentioned some things that happened as a kid and a bad divorce that she went through. And I, I think about that every so often because here she was doing all the right things that we're taught that we're supposed to do. But yet here she is with a, she's on her last legs with a stage four cancer, been in severe pain for a long time. And she wants to know why. And she's digging and she's coming to the conclusion that there's something else that was involved. And it most likely had to do with a stress response or old trauma that had been unprocessed or had been unhealed, right? That's just kind of a little bit of an example of how there's way more to the story than just what we're trying to do on the physical side. Yeah, I think, you know, and, and you tell those, that, you know, that story and I'm like, I, you know, look, I've got patients right now that have very similar stories, right? That, that they're, they're doing yoga, they're exercising, they're getting their cardio in, like, you know, they're eating better. Occasionally we're getting them into kind of like some, some fasting states to clear up damage, um, to, to, you know, detoxify and clear out any of these stored, um, toxins in the body. And yet they're still having trouble with certain things. And, and me as a practitioner seeing it, like, you know that there is a central component to this, that this is an, 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 you know, kind of what you're talking about. This is an emotional issue that they are dealing with that it, when stress comes and their brain starts to take off and starts to tell these stories that I'm always going to be like this and it goes. Um, and, and it's one of the most frustrating things that I see because it's like in some of these cases, and I'd love, love to hear your thoughts on this, like they are in therapy right now they are having these conversations and when i talk to them about what what conversations they're having it appears to be good therapy you know like not it like you know look not everything's created equal not all your doctors are created equal all that stuff but um when you talk to them it sounds like somebody who is really trying to do a good job to get to to some of these deeper issues but it just doesn't seem to be moving the needle um, when you, when you come across those situations, uh, what's your, you know, what's your pathway for that person forward? Yeah. So this is, um, all those things you mentioned are very important. They should be done, right? I mean, that's where we start. Let's clean up the body. Let's get into some fasted states. You know, we hit those autophagy patterns where, you know, we can fix a lot of things with the body, but yet we're still sick. You know, what, <laughs> what's really going on? So Everyone that's dealing with all kinds of things that are happening in life should have a therapist, all right? So be able to talk to these problems. This is very important, very essential. But Derek, at the same time, if talk therapy were king, we would all be healed of our emotional issues. 
if talk therapy worked for everyone, then we wouldn't have to continue and our bodies would heal and everything would be fine. What we find is that there are deeper subconscious patterns of thinking that are at work. Subconscious patterns means this may not always be in the forefront. This may not always be the stuff that you're sitting in front of your therapist saying, you know, I've got this problem, right? There's something deeper. I'll give you kind of an, an extreme example. I had a patient, uh, uh, she was probably in her early 30s, very pretty woman, and she was struggling with, uh, I don't know if you even call it OCD, but she had had a very rough childhood. Drug abuse was involved, some other things were involved, and uh, she had actually gotten out of this, and she had married a really good man. And this guy treated her like gold. And she's, she's telling me this. He's perfect. He's just perfect. She says, but there's this other guy. And she goes, I knew him when I was in high school. And I just can't stay away from this other guy. And he treats me horrible. <laughs> and he he beats me. And he he talks down to me. And he hurts me. And I can't not stop seeing him and so she had actually moved out and moved in with this other boyfriend and she was struggling she said why 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 can't i not pick up the phone and call him why you know and for her as bad as she knew this behavior was knowing what how bad our behaviors are doesn't make them go away otherwise talk therapy would work for everyone yeah if we knew programming the, the behavior component of it there's something much deeper going on and for her You know, this boyfriend offered the scenario, oh, this is familiar. This is like my childhood. (laughs) This is where I feel comfortable. So we work through some special stuff that we've we've now uh, gotten out of Europe. It's a special system that's designed to help release some of these deep subconscious blocks. The ones that we're not aware of, the ones that we can't really get to in talk therapy. The therapists that we work with who use our system Say, Nick, I can get done in six months with what you're doing with talk therapy and with what you're doing with your system that would normally take me three years. Yeah. Yeah. I, we have a I have a, a like a friend of a friend who does research on um, Ibogaine, Iboga, the, the kind of plant medicine where they they are doing the the, um, you know, so for those who don't know, like Ibogaine is a psychedelic plant that people will consume and it gives you, you see all the visions, you know, your visual cortex lights up and these people have all these kind of things going on. Um, and when they combine that with, with really good, um, you know, talk therapy, it's probably deeper than that. If he would, he would explain it. I'm, I'll probably butcher this whole thing, but, um, uh, <laughs> forgive me, Jason. Um, but, uh, when they combine that with therapy, their results have been amazing. Um, and, and, you know, some of the statistics that I've heard from him is that, you know, right now for depression and PTSD, if we're just doing therapy alone, the way we're doing this with a lot of our armed forces, we're about, if we're lucky, 20% successful. Hmm. When they add these types of compounds to it to get to that deeper level that you're talking about, you know, in some of these studies, we look like we're getting above 75%. That's like out of the, this world. That's this crazy level of, of change, right? 20% to 75%. Um, and, and some of the explanation around that is like, we're, we're getting into some of these like wiring things that we can't do consciously by having a conversation. We're using these things to get in. And, you know, let's take PTSD. You have wired this traumatic event into your subconscious. And so every time certain situations arise, those wires just turn back on and you loop that traumatic event over and over. No matter what you do, you can't refocus your mind and change that, at least not without some deep work. So whenever they combine these things that's where the real power seems to come from is is let's give you the thing that can help us break this pattern of wiring into the subconscious from these events whether that's childhood or or a traumatic event in in 
you know, in life, such as, you know, being at war or something like that, something terrible. Um, and that's where the real power comes from. That's where we get to this point where we actually might have an answer in the future that can change, you know, some of these, these statistics around trauma, depression, PTSD, suicide. Um, so when y'all are looking at some of these things, it sounds like that that's that's kind of the answer is is can we find some of these things that work and combine that with you know really effective therapy so we're checking the whole system we're checking all the boxes i think that's a a perfect example of 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 how people are starting to uh, really break through some of this trauma and to actually heal um it's clear when we go through trauma the research shows that there's a significant alterations in brain chemistry and how neurotransmitters are, uh, you know, reuptake into the uh, the neurons and how that whole thing works. We also know that there's a significant amount of uh, uh, elevated cortisol levels, and chronic elevated cortisol levels can cause all kinds of different patterns. And so we know that there's some research associated with the brain chemistry associated with that. We also have to look at the pattern, just the basic old pattern that neurons that fire together wire together. Right. I mean, it's a habit, right? It becomes a habit. And that's why you can do something for 30 days and you make new neural connections. So you get a situation where now it becomes much more easier. Well, that's same to be said for chronic states of anxiety, chronic states of depression and uh, PTSD that cause these sort of things. So we know that the research is out there and, and it's associated with that. When you talked about all of those other methods, you know, you've got the ayahuasca, the MDMA, we've got all these things. And I think those are all getting us to a point where we're progressing forward. What I like to say with our system, you know, bring, bring everything you got. Bring, you know, all your yogas, your meditations, your visualizations. Just bring what you have and see if we can't add to it. Yeah. See if we can't take you to another level uh, that you haven't been to yet. Yeah. Yeah. It's always kind of this thing. Like, I mean, even for us, you know, it, when we're treating pain from the physical standpoint, we're like, there's a hierarchy of treatment that you can go down. So, you know, you have a pain problem. Is it a movement issue? And we fix the movement issue that can be done over Zoom, right? Like, ah, you're moving that wrong. Stretch that out. You'll be better. If that answer is no to that, then we need to get some some hands on stuff. If the if that doesn't work, then we need to get some activated healing, whether that's, you know, acupuncture or something that stimulates a true response inside the body. If that doesn't work, then maybe we're going to do like regenerative therapies and add some compounds on top of that, you know, it, treatment that actually stimulates healing. If that doesn't work, maybe if we're staying on the, the, the true physiological healing, we might be doing stem cells. And right, you know, we go through that, you know, I very rarely tell somebody to jump up and do the, the, the top level one. I don't like come in. Hey, I've got this little shoulder issue. Oh, go do go do a ten thousand dollar stem cell treatment. No, we, we go through the steps. I think at some point in the next, you know, hopefully not this long, but probably decade, if I know how the medical system moves, that that will be the same thing when we start looking at, you know, um, psychological issues, uh, stress, depression, all of these things where it's like, hey, I have a little bit of an issue. OK, cool. Let's start here. Hey, that's not resolving. It's a couple weeks. I'm not quite feeling right. Um, let's move up a little bit. Let's try some of these more intense, you know, therapies. Hey, that's not quite there. Let's move up. And we have an actual action plan of moving up in, um, you know, intensity of treatment, if you will, all the way up to some of these top things that I will say, I am quite proud that some of these, you know, large institutions are, have, have opened their minds up enough to start doing research on some of these, um, you know, compounds that we thought were taboo for so long. Um, I, I'd like to get your thoughts on kind of that, like what does that hierarchy actually look like? What should it be to start? Um, you know, what, what types of therapies, what types of compounds and supplements should people be looking at if this is part of their their journey if this is part of their life and i know that i have a an emotional component to my pain what what do i start with what's that bottom floor and then what does it look like as we climb so i think typically most people are going to start out with a therapist because that's 
that's acceptable in our society as the first place to go and often the only place to go, right? Yep. So someone's going to go through therapy. They're going to do some different things like that. Um, uh, EMDR is very popular, has been shown to release a lot of, uh, a lot of past trauma. That's a great step. Uh, then you can go into all these other sort of areas. I personally like to take the approach of safest first, right? You know, I know that people are getting great results from MDMA and uh, all these mushrooms and different things like that. But I've heard some stories that have not been so good. So one has to be aware that there's a little bit of risk associated with that. So I typically like to look at things from the safest way yep. uh, first before I would go to a psychedelic where I'm not really sure, and neither is the practitioner, what's exactly going to happen. So that kind of just, you know, I hesitate just a little bit before yeah. going that direction. So we use specific homeopathic compounds um, that are very safe, uh, high dilutions, and that's been proven to show some good science for the last almost 300 years. So we typically go in that sort of a fashion before we end up at the, at the end of the spectrum where we get the psychedelics. Yeah, I, and that's why we go the route we do with pain as well is, is you know, you don't jump to surgery because it's the most risky. So let's go through and give your body the chance to do everything else we can possible before we get to those. And I think this is no different. You know, we, we, we have to make sure we're going through these things. I've got some similar stories of, you know, these things not quite going the way that we want. Um, right. And when we're dealing with, with the chemical makeup of the brain and how it's functioning um that's that's risky business we can't say that it's not there's amazing potential but that's why we're studying this but but it's still something that you know you're we're 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 changing who we are on some level you're messing with the chemical makeup of the brain so uh, i think we should do that going from safest and we're always trying to find that line, right? Like what's the what's the most effective and safest? And if we can start in that little category of like, hey, my risk reward is very, very heavy in the reward standpoint, and there's very low risk. My worst, you know, my 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 biggest risk is that, you know, I, I lost a hundred dollars and and I tried this for sixty days or whatever it might be. Um, I like those things first because, you know, we, we really put people in a good position to succeed. What, when you're talking to somebody, what are these little small signs that they might be in this camp? Uh, you know, that you've got these, these physical issues. Is there kind of telltale signs that maybe this isn't strictly coming from a physical standpoint? Is it just all chronic pain? You know, you're, you've been having this issue for six months on. Um, is there some other stuff that you tend to look for? What questions are you asking that really kind of tells us this is, this is where you're the, at least the bulk of some of your pains coming from or your issues rather? Yeah. A lot of that just takes place in the intake, right? So mm -hmm. as we're kind of in the discovery, we're kind of under trying to figure out exactly what's going on. By the time they get to me, they've already, they usually have gotten to the point where they're like, yeah, I've got a messed up pass and I know it's probably got something to to do with my chronic pain. Um, but it doesn't always have to be just chronic pain, right? It could be, I, I had a lady I was doing a podcast with and we were chatting and she said she's allergic to, to tree nuts. And she had got to the point where she's like, I mean, it really throws me off if I even get around these things. And she's probably in her thirties. And uh, we started talking, I says, when did that actually happen? And she goes, well, you know, as a kid, I remembered eating pistachios, like there was no, no trouble, no problem, you know? And uh, then probably by my teenage years, I, I seemed to have a problem. I said, okay, let's narrow it down. Well, you know, when did that, you know, what else was uh, uh, happening at that time? Yeah, you know, I had a really trauma, traumatic uh, parents divorced when I was about 12. And then she goes, damn, that was right about the time that I started becoming allergic to tree nuts, right? So these, these physical manifestations, whether it be chronic pain, right? Whether it be a unknown etiology of, uh, you know, I have skin issues, right? I have allergies, I have, you know, whatever it might be, there's often some little traumatic event or something associated with, with these sort of symptoms that are happening the way that they are. 
So if, if, if somebody's listening to this and they're like, look, I've had this health issue. I had, I was always, you know, feeling great. And then I started having, you know, severe fatigue. We've done all the tests. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't pick up. Or I, I was in great shape. I never had any pain. Somehow I started having this problem. I had a rough pregnancy, you know, since then I've been in chronic pain since, um, I've got weight gain that I, that I don't know where it's coming from. I keep trying to do everything. Would it be something that like, okay, what was going on in your life around the, the time that that happened and really kind of, you know, do some journaling stuff on that and try and get it all out. What changed in the, the years preceding and during, um, is there some other stuff that they can do to start to say like, uh, because I do think it's probably valuable. You can talk to this to know at least where the, where the, you know, ideology is, where the event happened. What was it that, that grabbed you and started this spiral? Well, we can definitely, we want to start there, right? Mm -hmm. We want to start there with, okay, what do we think we've got an emotional component with this? Often they can pull something up, mm -hmm. right? But, you know, I'll give you an example with myself, right? I have not chronic pain sort of issues. When I um, was introduced to the method that I currently use, uh, we use some kinesiology and, and we to test to find out which combination of homeopathic remedies that one needs to be on. And um, they tested me and they pulled up with one associated with the feelings of isolation. Now, I grew up on a potato farm in Idaho, okay? I had a really good family. Um, I worked a lot, you know, we had a lot of fun, didn't get in a lot of trouble. Worst thing we did was probably, you know, climb the city water tower, steal stop signs and kiss too many girls. You know, that's probably our biggest problems, right? So I'm like, I don't feel like an isolated sort of person, but you got to remember most of these people that we're dealing with, with chronic pain, for example, it may be a subconscious way of thinking right it may not be i can recall where this all started they may just be like i don't know right so i started on these little remedies associated with isolation and these they take some time and i remember uh about three weeks in i had a dream and this dream was as vivid as could be it happened to be a past memory and i saw myself as a kid eight nine going out to the playground play on the baseball diamond with a couple friends and my friends started making fun of me and I saw myself turn around go over to the monkey bars and just go play with someone else I woke up and I, I mean I had not thought about this probably since the day it had actually happened right but here we are subconsciously something deep down may have been giving me the uh, effect of feeling like I was isolated you know, and maybe if you would ask someone else, they'd say, oh, yeah, Nick, he tends to keep to himself a little bit more. Or, you know, he's not as engaged as maybe he should be for his overall health. So this is some of the stuff that we just may not be really aware of what's really driving it because it's so yeah. ingrained. We don't even see it as, a, as being a problem or recognize where it began. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was at a, this is to piggyback on that, but I think people will appreciate this because I think a lot of us have these things. I was at a conference, um, for, for speakers who were looking at, um, giving a Ted talk and they were doing these, these trainings for us. And at one of these, so we think we're showing up to like talk about crafting a public speech and like how to make the most impact on the audience. And, they bring us in this giant room and they say, all right, we're going to do some breathing therapy. And so they lay down 50 of these very, you know, type A, high achievers, super confident people. You know, all these people have done pretty amazing things. And they turn the lights off and in unison, they start taking us through this breathing, you know, kind of therapy. Um, and at the end of an hour, one, you realize how much you can change by breathing um, that opened my mind to a lot of this stuff that I think in my scientific training, um, I would have, I would have never really thought you could do. I mean, your whole body felt over an hour of doing this stuff changed everywhere. Um, when we sat up, I would, I would guess that 80% of that room was in tears, um, actually just crying. And for myself through that, there was memories and conversations that came up that that as they happened, I'm like, this isn't a made up memory. I, I know that this happened. 
And had you asked me 30 minutes ago, or I guess 60 minutes ago, if, hey, has this ever happened in your life? I'd have said 100% no. 100%, without a doubt, nope, never had any of those types of experiences. And then you finish that and you're like, oh my God. Like, wh- like that was so deep in there um, that I don't know where I lost it, but now that it's back, I can I can track back and see the gaps in my life where that got so repressed that I would have told you Nope, 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 nope. And then it's like you open that back up. And I can't say that, I, you know, recognizing that was some some major change and stuff, but it did open my eyes to how much we can take these things and repress them and push them down. And, and you know, if those are affecting you and you just have no idea that it's in there, we've got to have some ways to let your brain, body, and chemistry process that in a, in a healthier way so that doesn't just affect us throughout our whole life. Um, so I, I'm with you. I, I think it, it can't always be, oh, well, tell me about the car crash. Right. Um, There's probably some, some deeper things. <laughs> um, let, let's dive into the treatment stuff a little bit. So a lot of times when we're looking at people you know, w- w- who are having these things, I'm trying to pull the, like, the best research compounds for some of these at least from our standpoint, like I absolutely love omega threes whenever somebody is dealing with with any um, psychological stress. I think the research around that is 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 very very good in terms of improving anxiety and depression. Um, we use ashwagandha a lot in terms of like I I'm like I, I like this more in like the recent thing that I'm not processing real well. You know, like I know what happened. And I just don't feel good. I had a baby. I'm starting to feel, you know, like I'm not, I'm not getting back to myself. I think in sharp bursts, ashwagandha can be super powerful. Um, I'll caveat this for, with all those listening because I see a lot of patients who do this that keep taking it. And you see ashwagandha constantly suppressing our cortisol levels. And that's not really what we want. We don't want to just steadily depress them. We want to come off of some of those things um, so that we can let that system get back to normal. So a lot of times if I'm using ashwagandha, I'm like, you know, let's do it for a month or two and then let's come off of it. Um, so like where in that, that treatment process should people be looking for some of these, these, um, homeopathic, I think maybe we should define that as well, but some of the things that y'all are doing and, and is there anything else that you like to stack on top of these things from like a natural compound? So um, that was a great story earlier, by the way. I didn't get a chance to comment on that, but it's uh, uh, some great stuff. So when we look at what's available, right? Of course, omega-3s have significant amount of research that is behind them. Um, I'm probably not the one to give you all of that at this time because it's not my expertise, but I've done some of that research in the past and just come to come to the conclusion. This is one of the things that everyone should be on all the time. Yep. I have... Uh, I have a son who is at age of two was diagnosed with autism after a vaccine, uh, lost all eye contact. One answer to his name, he just disappeared, lost the speech and everything. Um, and it's, it's very clear when he's not on omega threes that he, he doesn't do as well. He's 18 years old now, right? So he's, he's he does pretty well. So what we have to look at different options first, when you look at ashwagandha, when you look at omega-3s, we're looking at the, a physical response. We're looking at um, biochemical reactions, right? Where we have absorption, we have you know waste materials, we have all these things that are sort of happening. And this is, this is great. And this is a, the first place where most people start when they look at different herbs that are available. There's a lot, ton of Chinese herbs that of course affect this sort of stuff. And all this sort of stuff is biochemical. From there, I mean, you have the options to do whatever you want to do. We particularly like the homeopathic realm, okay? And so you want to kind of define that, right? What are homeopathics? This area I'm pretty good at, right? So I kind of, this is where I kind of hang out. Homeopathics were developed in about 1798 by a guy named of Samuel Hahnemann, all right? Hahnemann was a medical professor at a school in Germany, and he started testing on his medical students, uh, diluted versions of natural substances all right so what we mean by that is we could take ashwagandha we could turn it into a homeopathic we could take a you know a mixture of ashwagandha and some 
water and alcohol, we call that like a mother tincture. Then we'd take one drop out of that solution. Now we put it in a clean bottle of water. We're taking one drop out of that, we put it into a, a third and a fourth and we dilute it down. And so by the time we get to 10X, that's 10 times diluted, most of the time you take it to a lab and they'd be like, there's nothing in here. This is nothing but water. But research has shown that, that that's actually not the case. What seems to happen is the essence or really from research shows the electromagnetics associated with these materials can be retained in water in and of itself. Okay, so this was demonstrated in the early 80s by a guy named Jacques Benveniste out of France. And he took, and this was published in Nature, um, one of the largest medical journals that are out there. It caused huge uproar and everyone was trying to debunk it. That was not accepted at the time. He took uh, natural substances, diluted them to a 7X and could cause an immunological response by degranulating basophils. So basal fills are immune cells, right? When they have, uh, they're not like mast cells where they contain lots of histamine, but they contain lots of various mediators that are responding during an Im when an immune system is, is in a reactive state. So how in the world did water, according to you know just our normal measurements, is able to degranulate and cause an immunological response? That re that experiment has been uh, done hundreds of times over and now proving that that is actually true, that it, it can. So the research coming out of Russia, which is, you know, some very, very cool stuff is showing, uh, because we have the equipment now to actually do this. And that's really what makes the biggest difference. So they've used, uh, equipment, dynamic light scattering. This actually detects various particles in water that are like, uh, very small nan nanometers to to extremely small particles we have nanoparticle tracking analysis they also have um precision conduct conduct conductmetry it's hard even to say that word <laughs> <laughs> which measures the electromagnetics right of what's happening and then of course they've used um uh, transverse laser microscopy and they've been actually to show if you, you take these diluted substances and you actually put them in a vacuum so that the water actually disappears like it typically would, they are finding, they call it nano associates. They're finding nanoparticles when they look through uh, these microscopes to show that there actually is something that's in these diluted substances. And this is really the, the bottom essence of homeopathics yeah that they're electromagnetic by nature yeah I, you know when when i heard that initially i'm i probably like most medical people were like <clears throat> um yeah we're we're giving people water this is placebo effect which i'm fine with right you know you're like when you first kind of dig into that stuff you're like you know i don't if they get better there's things that we do a terrible job of treating in the medical system. And so if we can figure out another way to do it and put our ego aside and not be the ones that actually did it, then that's okay. You know, we're getting into a way of, of tapping into the natural healing response from the placebo effect. Um, and then you start to really think about it and start digging in the research of, you know, even if you start looking at, at water, right, and, and like the structure of water and changing some of that using, you know, electromagnetic changes to it. And we know that, you know, like structured water, are you familiar with some of that stuff um, yes. on like that, that that will give better health responses, not only to us, but to other living organisms. Um, then you say, well, if I put some compound in a water, to say that I haven't changed that structure in another way is is not possible. You know, if you put something in water and you dilute it, that whole the structure of all of those, you know, you know, atoms, if you will, has probably changed based on what that is. So I think if there I, I've I've changed or at least lightened my stance on it. Um, I, I wonder if it's not one of those things that when we try and study it, because I mean, you know, when you look at the research around these things, I think it's hard to, to find where the, where the benefit comes from 
in terms of homeopathy, right? You know, you, you dig a, a, the whole vast uh, array of research around it kind of says, ah, you know, up and down, but so does manual therapy. So does, you know, needling in, in some cases, depending on what you're treating. But a lot of times when you really dig into the way that those studies are done, you say, well, ah, you know, that's not really how we would use it in clinic anyway. Right. So there's a lot of different things that you want to sort of keep in mind when you're using homeopathy. I mean, every therapy that you deal with is going to have its, its edges, right? You know, and, and with homeopathy, it's picking the correct remedy. That's where, where we go, you know, cause there, cause you homeopathics can be made out of disease tissue. They can be made out of, you know, healthy tissue. Uh, they can be made out of insects. They can be made out of, uh, a toxic plant material, but in a dilution, the toxicity is gone. And so you're just dealing now with the electromagnetics associated with that particular substance. Yeah. So there's a lot of things that, that are kind of thrown into the mix. We have a system where we use specific compounds and a testing method to find a combination of remedies that will really kind of help the people with what they're sort of dealing with. But you do have to kind of keep all those things in mind. Gerald Pollack, if some of you may know that reader, he put out a book a little while ago, researcher uh, up at the University of Washington, a book called The Fourth Phase of Water. So we have liquid, gas, and solid. But he talks about how water has this ability to restructure itself based on its interactions. And he calls them exclusion zones. And how certain water, it'll move away and the, the, the molecules themselves will change based on their environment and what they interact with. So water, that's a whole nother substance that, you know, experts could lecture for hours on. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I do think, you know, like one of the therapies that we use in our office is uh, pulse electromagnetic field therapy, PEMF. Um, and, it, you know, you, when you look at it, it's really tough in the early stages because it's something that we haven't thought about. Like we can't see it. Um, and so a lot of people initially start to say like, hi, ah, you know, I don't feel anything. Um, I don't know if anything's going on. And, and then when you start to look at it, I, I wonder if over the next 20 years, there's not a whole new like understanding about, uh, the electromagnetic functioning uh, of the body and how we actually, um, uh, function, how our cells function you, and, you know, this thing that, you know, you look at, at history and we didn't quite understand blood flow for a long time and we figured that out and that leveled up our ability to impact health and we didn't understand immune function and, and um, you know, microcellular response and we figured that out and that allowed us to, to level up how we can keep people healthy. Um, I feel like we're kind of at the very tip of the iceberg with some of this in terms of how does the electromagnetic function around the body change how healthy the cells are, how the cells communicate, the chemical response in the cells. So I wonder if that's not the next evolution of research of us understanding how this, how this amazing complex thing works inside of us. Well, I'd like to agree with you, but unless there's significant money to be made, <laughs> you know, it's hard to uh, patent and sell diluted water, Dr. Derek. So, you know, uh, we always got to keep that in mind that the powers that be that have the money, they want to make sure that they can patent whatever it is. And, you know, water's tough to patent. Uh, yes, yes, I, I do agree with some of that stuff. Um, hopefully there's enough like geeky nerds out there that make in a lot of money that they're like, you know what? I want to know this just because I want to know this. Um, I'm a big uh, I'm a big fan. Most of the people who have listened to this of Da Vinci because he was literally just curious, just for the sake of being curious. I just want to know what's happening inside, outside. How does water move? How's the human body work? I'm like, I, you know, can we all tap into our our inner Da Vinci and and have some curiosity and put that to work? So when people are are looking at at using some of these things. What's the process? Because I know that if we're looking at, at home homeopathy, like you said, there's a lot of different things. And that's kind of what I was alluding to in terms of research. It's like, you know, they lump all that together and say this. We studied all of homeopathy. You're like, well, who did you use it on? Which compound did you use? 
you know, there's all kind of nuances to this. And, you know, if you're not in that world and you're just trying to run a research study, that's going to be really tough for you to, to do it the way that it should be done. Um, I feel the same way about kind of, you know, dry needling, manual therapy, all, all of those things. But that's a soapbox for a different episode. Um, but so when someone's kind of going going into this and they want to use this as part of their regimen, what's the process? How do they go about identifying, hey, what do I actually need and what's going to help me the most? So that's a great question. And that's going to I'm going to give you a little history to kind of help answer that. Right. Mm -hmm. So our system is, is a unique system. It's not just homeopathic remedies that you can just oh, it's one single ingredient. There are combinations of different ingredients at various dilutions okay mm -hmm. and so they we have patents on them and the system came out of europe it was designed by a medical doctor who actually was using uh treating lots of women with all kinds of emotional sort of issues and he was using bach flower remedies so we've seen bach flowers you can buy them almost any grocery store and they're great they're they're homeopathics they're diluted versions of flowers which you know flowers make people feel better especially women right and so he found that he would use these bach flowers and his patients would improve but a given two or three months it they seemed to hit a wall and they just couldn't get over kind of the hump to really healing so he went on a little bit of a of a mission to find something that would work and so over the course of 20 years he came up with about 28 different remedies they're uh, combinations of all sorts of different ingredients at different uh, dilutions and uh, it started working really well they got involved uh, got to put on the German tel television equivalent of Oprah and it just really took off there so our method is has actual research so we have it's all been it's been in Europe for about 20 years okay it's got about uh, eight books uh, we've got 300 articles that have been published. Lots of the naturopathic journals here in the U.S. have published those. Um, and then 11 clinical studies. They had one study published in the Swiss Holistic Medicine Society where they took uh, 11 clinics, over 1,000 patients, and they asked, it was self-reporting, um, how was your therapy? It could be excellent, good, satisfactory, or not good at all. And 86.6% uh, of those patients ranked their therapy as excellent, good, as satisfactory. And that had to do with a conglomeration of different symptoms. So they had, uh, they had anxiety, they had depression, they had migraines, they had chronic pain. Uh, they had even some, some, some cancer in there. They had skin disorders, allergies. So th what our system treats is the underlying emotional subconscious pinnings that may be driving one's physical illness and when we treat that just like the old iceberg image that we've all seen what, what's really going on underneath may really be the solution to fixing what's going on in our in our consciousness so all of a sudden if if all of our energy is being sucked up by old emotional issues and all of a sudden the bot we take care of those the body has the ability to heal itself it has all this ability with with excess energy to do what it needs to do. So that's a little bit of our system. It's not quick, right? Dissolving subconscious behavioral and negative patterns is, you know, it's not always a snap. So our therapy takes about a year. Um, they get big milestones along the way, but uh, we get some phenomenal results with what we do. So y'all, this isn't like a substitute um, for these other types of like, you know, biological support, you know, like we were talking about omega three, that's very much supporting, you know, the, the, the biological processes in the body, you, you know, what y'all, what y'all are doing is something that's not addressed by any of those types of things. So it would be kind of a, a stack on top of that so that we're, Hey, let's support the biological, but let's get in there and support the, the central mental emotional component as well. Exactly. So it, it's definitely a stack, sort of the, the method. It's not biochemical. It's definitely energetic. It's electromagnetic. And it's working on a, on a layer that's just much deeper than what's happening with the typical cellular processes of, you know, hormones and receptors and binding and things like that. Now, if somebody's adding that to their, their kind of stack of therapies, are they, are they picking that through a therapist? Um, 
you know, what's that process look like? And, and if they are, how do they find a therapist that actually does that? Yeah. So we just, the, the method was actually in the U S about a decade ago. Um, FDA actually shut us down. So, um, we actually had to, to come back in. It's manufactured in a FDA approved facility here in the U S now. So we just relaunched in January. There are still several practitioners around, but yeah, you would get together with a practitioner. We can do it through zoom. Uh, we use a kinesiology based muscle test to, to find which remedies are going to be best for that individual. We can ship those to the individual if they don't live within the area of a practitioner and they just, they're very easy to take. They come in a couple little bottles. You take 12 drops, put it in a half a glass of water, 12 drops of the other half a glass of water. You drink the water twice a day. So it's very easy to do, uh, just takes, and then the, the way the therapy works is they, it goes in themes. So you may be on the theme of like, I talked about isolation earlier that may go on for three months. And then at the end of three months, we say, all right, it's time to retest and very onion layer. Like we peel back some of these deeper subconscious issues and people just get, I mean, fantastic results. Sometimes I scratch my head. I'm like, I don't know how this is really possible, but it really, the self discovery, um, it, it can just be phenomenal. That's amazing. I did uh, digging into some of the y'all's um, uh, like compounds and stuff. I see that they are uh, like titled, if you will. They like what do they treat? Do y'all? I, I know perfect situation is is there kind of assessing and picking that through a therapist. Uh, do y'all? If somebody says like I know I have uneasiness and I just don't feel right, do y'all? let them just get the uneasiness compound. Um, how, how, how does that process work? If somebody's like, this is what I feel that one matches me. What's your, what's your pitch on that? It doesn't seem to work that way is okay. what we've found. We have yeah. five remedies. So there's 40 remedies in the line. All right. There are five that are acute remedies. We call them neurovita for nervousness, anxiousness, you know, sort of that mm -hmm. sort of stuff and anxiety, like anxia vita. And then we have Simvita and Paravita, which is sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system dysregulation, right? Where they're, it's flipped upside down. You know, they just can't get out of bed when they should be revving up and vice versa. Those can be given at any sort of time. But some of the deeper ones, I'll just give you a quick example. You know, I had a guy, um, sex addiction, right? And really good looking guy, as fun, happy as could be, but... He was a disaster, right? And he was going out and he felt like I just need something to, to, you know, um, help me with my uneasiness, you know, this sort of thing. And when we tested him, um, his feelings had the remedy he really pulled up for was, uh, unfulfilled needing to be loved. And he's like, my dad left when I was 14 and I never could, I could never, I could never uh, make my dad love me enough. I just never felt that from him and he was, wasn't around. He, he wasn't in my life. So it's hard to just say, Oh, I need this based on symptomology yeah. because it goes much deeper to the pattern of why the behavior or the illness is, is manifesting. Awesome. Um, Nick, thank you. This has been, this has been an awesome conversation. I think as we're all on this kind of journey to health, it, you know, it's very, very easy for a lot of people, um, healthcare practitioners more than any uh, to uh, get into this situation where I think we, you know, we, we're a little bit closed minded to, um, some of these things that we can't quite see or that haven't been as prevalent in, in healthcare. And I think, you know, being able to pump the brakes for a minute and actually kind of, you know, think about these things from, um, a, a patient improvement standpoint and saying kind of what we were talking about earlier, the risk reward ratio, um, and, and, and given some of these things, uh, you know, some thought and being open-minded enough to maybe change our mind about some of these things. Um, you know, it, certainly my, myself included, but that's why I love these conversations. Cause you're like, you know, when you get real patient stories around these things, um, you realize that there's people that need help that aren't getting it with the way that we're, we're practicing medicine today. And so to keep, you know, doing the same thing, banging our head against the wall, expecting a different result, um, is, you know, not going to help. You know, everybody attributes that to, 
Einstein definition of insanity is, you know, doing the same thing, expecting a different result. I don't even know if he said that from what I hear, I think no, but, um, (laughs) but I think this falls in that, right. You know, there's times where we need something deeper, you know, we need to address some things that we're not addressing. So, um, thank you for, for sharing all these things and getting this out into the world. I'm sure there's people who, you know, their lives are getting changed by some of these things that, that would not be addressed with kind of the way that mainstream medicine is, is rolling these days. Uh, where can people find a bit more information about this stuff? Hey, you know, this matches me. Can I, can I, can I get in touch with Nick? Can I, um, you know, go about finding some of these practitioners or anything like that? Yeah. So our website is, uh, www.privia, P R I V I A naturals with an S dot com. Um, go there. If you're a patient, you're looking for a uh, therapy, uh, there's a big button that says, we want to hear your story, book a consult. You know, we'll talk to you about it. Our therapy is not outrageously expensive. It's not like going to a $10,000 help, help self-help seminar. It's not $5,000, you know, a year therapies in about 2,900 bucks and, uh, can big changes. And we're looking for therapists that say, you know what, um, functional medicine, chiropractors, acupuncturists, naturopaths, integrative medical doctors that say, you know what, I, I want to add another piece to the puzzle of what I'm doing and uh, see if I can't better, better what I'm doing as a practitioner. I love it. Um, and we'll put, we'll put links to everything. Do y'all have, you were talking about some of the studies. Do y'all have uh, links to some of that stuff on your website? Yeah, that's right. So Beautiful. the big, the big one there with a thousand patients that's on the site. There's several other articles about, you know, subconscious negative patterns of thinking and how they're manifested. Lots of clinical cases. Um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff there to kind of love it. Yeah, we'll we'll link to all that stuff in the show notes for all of y'all, so you can kind of get access to some of that and really dig into this if this is something that you want to geek out on. Which I hope you do. I hope you do. Um, Nick, we ask all of our guests if you can tell people to do one thing today to improve their health. What would that one thing be? Oh, you know, I I think uh, from a different standpoint, we can all get um, just don't take don't take life so serious. Don't take yourself so serious. Uh, forgive others and be kind. That'll eliminate a lot of problems in life. So I think a lot of just following the golden rule is, is there's more health benefits than that in any supplement we could ever take. I love it. I love it. Nick, thanks a lot, man. This has been awesome. Great. Thank you.